morning and or good afternoon rather and welcome to the Maudsley Learning webinars called Challenging Conversations. So why did we give it that name? We give it that name because we want to bring right to the front of everybody's mind the issues that really challenge us working in mental health today. Difficult issues, very very tricky conversations, trying to find solutions. In this Multi learning webinar series. This is the fifth in our series. We've covered topics such as what's the impact of COVID on the workforce and service users. We've covered racism. How does that actually present itself? We've looked at are we training doctors to be the kind of modern futuristic mental health doctors and clinicians of the future. Today, our subject is restrictive practices. Do we need them? one of the hardest issues to get face to face with in mental health. In this series, we made a commitment absolutely right at the beginning that we would have these challenging conversations from different perspectives. So this is not an experts webinar with a series of experts telling you what the evidence says. This is a combination of people who in their different roles either live with restrictive practices, have experienced restrictive practices, have researched restrictive practices, and above all, people are absolutely focused on how do we stop these practices? How can we get the actions going that we need to be different? So I'm going to start today with my wonderful Ned, non-executive colleague on the board of South London and Maudsley, uh, Mike Franklin, who's going to explain explain to us why on the board of the trust, it has not ever been possible in my three years at the Maudsley sitting on the board to have a board without Mike talking about the need to stop restrictive practices. And then we will go to Anthony who's lived with it. We'll go to Lewis and Carla who are experts in the research. And we will go to Jackie who's actually a lived experience and is implementing. So let me start with my fellow Ned that is passionate about this subject. Mike, could you explain to us why you, and thank you for agreeing to come and give up your time and come into this challenging conversation. Uh, thank you, uh, Geraldine, and good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, Mike Franklin, I'm a member of the board, a uh, colleague of uh, Geraldine. Uh, and ever since I've been on the board at uh, South London Maudsley, uh, this has been one of the issues that's been close to my heart uh, not, not least because I grew up in South London. Uh, I know people that have been subject of restraint, both in our, uh, our organisation, in the local police stations, uh, and on the uh, streets of Lambeth, Southwark uh, and Croydon particularly. Uh, I know that this is an important issue because in spite of what people have said about us wanting to reduce the use of, res of restraint, particularly forcible uh, prone restraint, uh, it still happens. Uh, we've had people that have died on our premises, um, uh, which have been related to the use of restraint. It is inconceivable that we shouldn't be talking about this uh, more often. It is inconceivable that we should be uh, simply talking about reducing it rather than eliminating it. And it's inconceivable that we should not bear in mind uh, the consequences, the impact on those who are friends and family or in the community of people who have been restrained. I used to work uh, in the uh, police complaints environment. We used to see custody deaths of people that had been restrained. We used to see people who were humiliated by the use of restraint, family members who were distressed by seeing their loved ones uh, restrained. Uh, this is an important issue. Uh, and as Geraldine says, as long as I've been on the board, I've been raising it at every opportunity and I will continue to do so. Thank you very much, Mike, and perhaps uh, Later in the conversation, you can tell us about your national role and how, from a national perspective, you think that things can change. So let me turn now to Anthony. Anthony, are you linked in and on the call with us? Yes, I am, Geraldine. Great. Anthony, we are so grateful to you for coming back again on this panel. Your voice as someone with lived experience 
was so powerful that we, we had to hear you again on this subject. So can you share with us generously again your experiences about restrictive practices and your thoughts about, well, what actually makes the difference to stop it? Okay, I can share from my experiences and um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, thanks for the opportunity um, to share. Okay, first of all, I'd like to say that oftentimes I think it is unnecessary, this restraint. I think it's unnecessary, especially in my case, because they could have talked to me first before I, I was restrained in hospital. They could have talked to me. Um, and then second thing I want to say is that it's often a knee-jerk reaction. It's like you act first and then you ask questions after, sort of like a trigger-happy cop or that sort of thing. You, they ask questions. You act first and then you ask questions after. Um, so if people are taught anger management or dispute resolution skills, a lot of incidents may may well be reduced. Skills like hitting a pillow instead of a person, taking out frustration on or via exercise, or the magic of relaxation through music. As a black male, this is um, this is really important. So um, I like to say that. And one more thing, I like to talk about the unconscious bias. A lot of staff have a stereotype of what a black male who's schizophrenic is like, probably violent, aggressive, or out of control, um, and hence respond in that manner. Sorry. Um, it's not always, that's not always the case. It, it, it wasn't the case with me. I got into fights, but I'm not naturally aggressive, yet I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. So that's what I want to share. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, sorry, Anthony. And perhaps you can tell us a little bit about when you decided that you had found a clinician that offered you something different that behave differently to other people. You explained to us uh, about the use of medication and sometimes restraint being completely linked to medication giving. Um, and you talked about clinician that actually explained what medication was and why it mattered. Is that something you could share at this stage or would you rather share that in a bit? In a bit, please, um, Geraldine. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I turn then to Lewis Beams, who is a highly loved and valued uh, clinical nurse specialist, educationalist in restrictive practices at SLAM. Lewis, some of the questions people ask about restrictive practices are, well, can you actually predict it? Can you predict it being used? Do we know what the causes are? Could we, is there actually any evidence about how to stop this? What's, what's your reply as an expert in this field and what are we doing? In terms of the kind of evidence, I think there's one, for the first point I would like to make is around um, thinking of it as a clinical intervention and what is the evidence behind whether they are effective and safe interventions in themselves. So it's quite helpful at the moment that, we, that in the news we're hearing about the COVID vaccines and we, we've all had a lesson in what clinical trials mean and the stages mm -hmm. that we have to go through. So do, does, do, does any clinical intervention meet standards of safety and effectiveness and efficacy? If we were to apply that, that structure to restrictive practices such as restraint or the use of seclusion rooms, they wouldn't pass any of those research um, uh, protocols. So it, it, it's, it, I think that's a useful context to think about the fact that we are using, routine, using interventions routinely that, if, that, that have not met the same level of scrutiny and academic scrutiny that other intervention, we would expect other interventions to be applied. Um, and that kind of links to where do 
where does the use of restrictive practices come from? And in my mind, it's quite clear that it, it's something that is culturally driven within mental health services that has changed over time. So the use of use of uh, restraint techniques, for example, the first training in that was taken from the prison system. Why are we applying uh, skills and, and tools, if you like, from the prison system to people who are in hospital who are there to do, to receive care? Um, so that that kind of cultural element has changed over time, and it, it's shifting more and more towards thinking about being least restrictive and um, using interventions that in, in the safest possible way. Um, but even now, if you look internationally, so for example, within the UK, we um, we, we have a particular dislike for the use of any mechanical restraints, so things like handcuffs or straps to hold people, and we tend to lean towards the more, more of the use of uh, medications, so chemical restraint. You cross over the channel to our, some of our, our colleagues in countries in Europe, and they are horrified at how we use medications, but they use mechanical restraints much more heavily. So again, that kind of feeds back to the fact that there isn't an evidence base for the, these interventions, when you should use them, why you should use them particularly. Um, so we're ending up being driven more by the culture of the places in which these, these systems are, are working and playing out. Um, then I suppose the, the other bit that the kind of framework that I would like to offer up is around, and this is something that I, I spend a lot of time going and talking to teams about and, and using it as a structure to explore finding solutions and different ways of working. So it, it's um, a, the public health um, model of prevention, which is based on three different levels. Um, so the foundation of it is primary prevention. So those are the skills and the things that we do with people every day to improve their quality of life. So if, if I feel I have a good quality of life, if I feel supported and safe and I have access to the things that matter to me, I'm not going to become distressed and angry in the first place. So these are the things we should be doing for everybody all of the time. And I think that's this is probably the bit that we fall down on the most. So, for example, if if I'm coming into hospital because um, I've become unwell again, I should be coming into hospital with a plan that's been developed with my community team that accepts out that actually I like X, Y and Z and I prefer this, this and this. Um, so I think we, we, we should be investing in that level of uh, prevention a lot more and helping our staff um, to understand how to apply those skills and be creative. That's probably the nicest part of the job as a nurse. Um, the next level is around when somebody's starting to become distressed or angry using so secondary prevention when somebody's sort of starting to build up and become distressed and angry how we de-escalate that situation so how do we nip it in the bud before it tips over into being an actual incident again um we as as a mental health nurse probably as any mental health professionals we talk about de-escalation being being a really important skill but again the evidence base isn't there to support that I think I think the practical application of it is clear um, and when it's done well, you can tell it's being done well and it's effective. Um, however, we've struggled to kind of build the evidence base and really get to the an understanding of what is it that makes those particular skills or that combination of skills effective for different people. Um, and then the kind of the, the final level of that should be our last resort, which is the tertiary interventions, which is your restraint, your, your physical interventions, um, which are supposed to be only used when there's an active incident going on that requires an intervention to, to protect people or keep people safe. So I think we my, my kind of message would be we need to be pushing down and or looking upstream to the primary and the secondary work a lot more than we do. Lewis, absolutely fantastic challenges to the system, which is, you know, COVID is teaching us what scientific rigor is and evidence is. And as you absolutely say, that <clears throat> there have been so many treatments in psychiatry over centuries where people have started to do something and then it's continued. So fabulous challenge from someone who does it on the ground. And I love your systematic way of thinking, primary prevention, secondary prevention, tertiary prevention, and the fact that to do that, as you say, people need to feel incredibly proud of being a mental health professional because this is a serious level of skill, negotiation, anticipation. It's what the very best of mental health clinicians should really be feel taught and supported to do. Thank you, great challenges. And then we come on to Carla. Now, Carla is 
our new head of social work at the Maudsley. She's probably got something else in her title as well, but she's incredibly <laughs> welcome and has been brilliant around helping us with the changes and the use of the Mental Health Act. Um, Carla, I know that you live many lives and have a lot of evidence of different, a different, even a, a different way of thinking about uh, restrictive practices. Tell us what your views on this are. Right. Thank you, Geraldine, and thank you for having me and welcome to everyone uh, this afternoon. Yes, um, as my title says, I'm a social worker by background um, and I would like to kind of share, you know, in this um, kind of um, provocative type of conversation this afternoon and challenging conversation, the different perspectives um, in mental health health. Um, we often talk about a holistic kind of model of mental health. We talk about a biased, psychosocial, culturally inclusive uh, model of um, mental health. And it's important that when we do talk about restrictive restrictive practices that we bring all of that um, kind of holistic care into restrictive practices as well. And I kind of earlier made a comment that when people enter secondary mental health services, when they walk through the door onto our wards, they don't just bring their mental disorder and their set of risks um, with them. They bring their whole lives with them. And I think that's often so important, I think, as mental health professionals, that we remember that, that people bring their whole lives. They bring from where they come, what their history is, what their identity is, what their lived experiences are. And I often wonder whether within the NHS we kind of fully appreciate kind of that fact that people bring their whole lives to us. Um, in terms of kind of evidence base, I think I agree with what kind of Lewis said, there isn't that broad evidence base necessarily around restrictive practices, but there is kind of evidence around, um, you know, a few places where we know they have um, implemented um, kind of initiatives, like for example, Mercy Care is a kind of example where there is a very much positive approach and a proactive approach to restrictive practice and by that meaning kind of that very primary kind of prevention trying to prevent um, kind of escalations in behavior before that kind of happen and to do so I think it's important that we therefore understand where people are coming from uh, who they are what their strengths are what their family members are um, and involving families in those kind of conversations and positive care planning and advanced kind of care planning so that we kind of eliminate the need to actually go down the, the you know the the use of force or restrictive practice in the first place we know that if we work with people very early on within their communities if we strengthen things like um you know kind of housing debt um, kind of connections to to kind of communities that that in itself may prevent people coming into our service in the first place but when we they do enter our services it's about appreciation that people come to us um, with their full lives. And it's about using those kind of models and the social model when we think about, um, you know, alongside kind of all the other models when we think about restrictive practices. Um, and also for me, another point I wanna raise is the environment itself and the and what happens on our wards. Um, wards. Are those kind of therapeutic enough? Um, a lot of um, wards I have been through kind of my 30 years of um, in social work. Um, and I've been a approved mental health professional um, kind of practicing just up to a few years ago is a lot of those walls often feels like it's a place for containment and not often have all those therapeutic um, kind of activities um, and um, kind of uh, taking place and where I have seen it work is where the culture within kind of the organization and within right down to ward and within that MDT settings is creating kind of a type of a home therapeutic environment within those ward settings where um, people are on the walls feel that they are part of that board and can contribute. So for example, I've seen where I've worked previously where there are regular meetings with um, service users to talk about what they are happy or not happy with, with what is happening within the world. So if you kind of intervene and have those proactive conversations early with people and really listen to people, I think a lot of it can be kind of prevented as well. 
finally, just in terms of workforce, uh, Geraldine, before I forget that point, um, we talk about having a holistic kind of approach to kind of restrictive practices. But the question is, do we have the right people and the right roles within those settings? Do we have the need for more perhaps peer workers, maybe social, uh, social workers based within hospital walls, et cetera? So I want to really pose that within our conversation today as well. Fantastic. Another rich contribution. Thank you so much, Carla. So if I'm summarising correctly, both mm -hmm. you and Lewis and Anthony are saying, see me as a person, understand who I am as a person, not just a set of difficult symptoms, understand what my tensions are before I even come anywhere near a service, help me understand, educate me to help understand myself and how I can um, deal with my frustrations and anger, which is what Anthony really said at, at an early stage. And you're also saying that there are places and examples where people have reduced restrictive practices. I know on some of the forensic wards in the Maudsley, the four steps to safety, just incredible yeah. creation, as you said, Carl, of almost a therapeutic community where it's a family approach on that unit that, and their, their use of restraint is extremely, extremely low. I've certainly personally worked and set up a challenging behavior unit where I will be honest, interesting workforce, I could not get a psychiatrist to come and run the challenging behavior unit. I did not have. So I had this amazing woman who was an Iranian refugee doctor who was a child and family psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, she chose to come and start and help us run this new challenging behavior unit. And because of her approach, which was that of, we are all in this together. We are building a, a respectful family together in the three years that that Challenger Behaviour Unit was open, right in the middle of one of the most affluent areas of South London, we had only one serious significant incident that required restraint. And that was when that just wonderful woman was leaving and people were, were feeling agreed. So, so far we've come up with many, many solutions. This is not inevitable, which is the question Mike often asks on the board. So can I turn to our final um, contributor panelist this afternoon, who is just an incredibly welcome visitor from the one part of the country that's in tier one, the Southwest. Welcome, Jackie. <laughs> uh, and Jackie is an amazing person. And we're so grateful to have you who has two perspectives. One is the lived experience, living with it through a family member perspective. But then she actually has gone native and has joined the workforce and is bringing into the workforce in another organization new ways of, of, of reducing restrictive practices. So Jackie, please do share with us your, your multifaceted uh, experience. Um, thank you, Geraldine, and thank you for having me. And it's quite exciting to be here. So um, I feel quite honored to be part of the panel today, but thank you. So yeah, I do have two perspectives and um, I was trying to work out how long I've been doing this for. And I think it's fair to say I've been doing it for at least 31 years because I have a 31 year old son uh, who has autism and was labeled as having challenging behavior. But I also had a father who had Asperger's. So I think I've actually done it all my life uh, to be fair, because my dad used to have um, occasions when he would, he would find it very difficult to regulate his emotions. And so what I'm gonna bring is um, my learning as a parent supporting my son and my learning then as becoming a dance movement psychotherapist. So bringing in that psychotherapy side of things, but also um, dance and movements are bringing in body awareness to how we can help somebody, but also understand what's going on for us in these situations. So my journey started with having a son with autism. By the time he was four years old, he already had the label of challenging. He was challenging to services because he was extremely autistic. He can't speak, he still can't speak. Uh, when he gets challenging, his challenges are harm to self. So he'll headbutt him, his own head off the wall or bite his fingers. Or if he's really upset, he will headbutt other people. And he used to abscond and run away. So all his life really was around managing challenging behaviors. And I won't go into detail about what was helpful and what wasn't, but quite a lot of it wasn't helpful. Um, but I came across an organization called the Challenging Behavior Foundation, which is run and led by families 
um, they are very, very nationally known now. They work with um, lots of professionals. They are involved in the National Strategy Group for Challenging Behaviour. And I learned about something called positive behaviour support, which is really looking at looking at a, a sort of a functional analysis of what is the behaviour that my son, you know, why, why is he challenging really? And through a, lo a long time, it took ages, we worked out that a lot of the things that were stressing him, being autistic, was sensory integration. He wasn't able to process what we were saying to him. He could get bits of it, I think, uh, when he was calm, but when he wasn't calm, he couldn't understand. And then just understanding, so I changed from being, I was an accountant. I changed from being an accountant to being a dance therapist, really because uh, a psychiatrist in Bristol said, have you heard about dance therapy? And I went along and it was just amazing. And he was about 12 at the time. And it really felt like he was saying, it's about time you started to understand me. Because it's like we hadn't learned his language, but we were making mm. him learn ours. Um, so that was quite fascinating. And then learning all about psychotherapy. So I can echo what um, Carla said, it is very much about the person. And I think when you understand somebody's story, where have they come from? Um, so for him, although he had a very supportive family, he had 12 years of us not having a clue really what he was trying to say or why he was upset. So from the age of 12, we started to get better at that. But when he turned 18, the only services that he could go to was a challenging behavior unit for young adults with autism and challenging behavior. And we saw a very confident 18 year old decline within three years to he would and he got up to three to one support. Um, I do think restraint was used on him. We didn't even understand about restraint until we saw what it did to him. And the cost of that service as an accountant, I was shocked. I was really shocked. I thought you left him at home with me for 18 years and you barely gave us any support. And now at 18, you're willing to pay this amount of money. So I very flippantly said to our local authority, if you gave me that money, I'd do a better job. And it was around the time of valuing people and um, 2007 value and people was being refreshed. So they did, they gave me, they said, okay, we'll give you the money as a direct payment. So he's now living in his own home for the last 10 years. He's got his own team around him. We taught the team positive behavior support strategies. We've reduced from three to one support to one to one. He has two to one when he goes out and we've reduced most of his behaviors and we don't use restraint. Um, so then I started working in Bristol inpatients on, I started on the dementia ward and I was just talking with the ward manager saying, you know, this is a great thing, PBS, should we be thinking about it here? So she said, well, if you want to, you can bring it in. So we started looking at the incidences on a dementia ward were often around personal care. And I understood from my own son that personal care, if you're, if you're touching somebody and they don't understand why, then if couldn't it be quite frightening for them? So I started working with the teams about, well, how would you feel if four or five people were trying to take your trousers down? And they said, well, no, it's not very nice. I said, no, it's not, is it? So we started working on better ways, really. And they reduced that to, they could do personal care with one or two staff instead of having lots of staff. They started to understand things about how you approach someone, how you explain to them about what you're about to do. And they reduced a lot of the behaviors on the dementia ward. So then I think I came to the attention of the nursing, um, sort of the matrons and the, the inpatient managers. And they asked me specifically to go on the PICU wards to, to, to bring these ideas in on the PICU wards. So I started working on the um, female and male PICU wards initially, and I just started working with the team. Um, and to begin with, we started with less think as a team. What do you all know? How do you, between you, they, because I didn't know, they knew though, between them, what would uh, help somebody, what wasn't helpful for somebody. So we started mapping out, you know, when somebody was calm, I think, Louis, you talked about tertiary. So we call it green, amber, red, and blue, where green is their calm, amber is their off base, red is 
you're going to have an incident and then blue is post incident. So we started mapping out the behaviors and the strategies and as a team, what they noticed so that they talked amongst themselves. Oh, I've noticed she doesn't like us to talk to her. Oh, I've noticed she does like us to talk to her. So you do individual plans for people. And then gradually they took it on as a nursing team and they went and sat with each person. So for over the last three years, they would talk to each member of the ward that came in on the ward and they'd ask them how do you want us to support you what do you want us to know when you're distressed what would be helpful for you um and they really took it on as a team and everybody on the ward got person centered um pbs plan and they also started looking at the environmental factors about the use of um seclusion and enhanced care and cool down boxes or calm down boxes or so strategies proactive strategies like do they need to go out into the garden do they need to go for a walk do they need to use the gym all those proactive stuff so notice and as a dance therapist noticing the speed of somebody's movements are they sort of getting faster are they getting slower or is there pressured speech what's going on how are you relating to that person are you feeling a bit anxious what's going on in the member of staff if your arousal is rising that you know then you're both rising together it might be that you swap and somebody else comes in or you just give them some space so there's lots of things it's not just the person but how we respond in that moment that can make a huge difference between them escalating and them calming back down. And I think as the staff got more confident, I think it's an educational thing, as mm. the staff got more confident in using this. Um, and it was lovely on the male peak award when I started hearing them in Hando- Handover say, oh, so-and-so was in mostly amber today. We didn't see any reds. Or, you know, they were using the RAG color coding to hand over very quickly where somebody's emotional level was. Um, so I thought it was, it was great. It's a great tool. And it's just, yeah, I think in Bristol, we're trying to roll it out across the wards. We now do an all about me. So when people come in, they have a sort of a whole booklet that they can write in or their family can write in. Um, we've got Safe Wards initiatives. So we've got a Safe Wards lead who does a lot of work with staff about positive language, how you frame things instead of won't, maybe they can't. You know, looking at formulations about, early history is there a trauma if you're in an inpatient ward there's guaranteed to be some sort of trauma I think whatever that is it's it's there's likely to be some trauma there will be a story even if it's just the fact that you've left community and come into inpatients that's fairly traumatic in itself um so acknowledging that trauma and acknowledging a person's history and acknowledging everything that's really meaningful for them and working with them to manage it rather than um you know, feeling like it's imposed on them. Jackie, that's absolutely wonderful. The recurring theme throughout all of this is it's about the person. It's about helping the person understand themselves. It's about understanding. It's about being excited and interested in mm-hmm. the person. It's about developing new skills. And I think what I really love about what you've all said is that the skills that we're talking about are transferable from working with people with dementia, working with people with severe mental illness and perhaps psychosis and feeling really distressed. It's also transferable to educational settings. You know, people with dyslexia, that wonderful motto of the Dyslexia Society, if they don't learn the way you teach, then teach the way they learn. So look at what is it that makes people feel calmer and feel more in control? What is it they've learned about themselves that they can actually take take forward? That's just really great. Thank you so much. Mike, coming back to you as, you know, now holding really important national roles, do you feel more hopeful about the possibilities or do you think, what do you think we need to do to fast track getting this knowledge and learning escalated so that it's everywhere? I think a number of things from all all the contributions um, uh, so far. I mean, mean, you know, Anthony's point about unconscious bias is is, is an issue. Um, there was a question posted by Blandida in the uh, Q&A um, about what about the staff and one of the dilemmas we've had in SLAM has been balancing this position of, uh, of eradicating the use of restraint uh, against concerns about staff safety. Now whether that's perceived or, or real it is, it's an issue um, and you know we, we, have to, we have to grapple with that and, and uh, I think Jackie's uh, 
points about um, uh, about how staff uh, engage with uh, patients. One of the considerations isn't just about um, you know what the patient wants and what the patient needs. It's also about the context uh, on, under which they're actually there in the first place. Um, mm. uh, we have in in our trust we have people that we have in uh, secure uh, places who have been brought in by by police officers, which means they may well have been handcuffed or arrested before they come to us. Um, they may well have spent time in a police custody cell, um, and the historical context of uh, patients and service users uh, across South London and Maudsley isn't just about what happened to Senny Lewis. It's about the experience of other people and other people's families uh, and, and members of their family. And it's about the collective uh, perspective of the community that we serve. So uh, yes, the unconscious bias issue is an issue. Uh, yes, the stereotyping of the potential danger of patients may be something that arises from that community uh, context and what people hear and see happening in, in the community. Uh, and Lewis's point about clinical trials, I mean, that's a fascinating uh, mm. perspective that, that I haven't heard before, and I'm going to be using that next time <laughs> we have the discussion on the board, because you're absolutely right. If we're talking about, uh, about clinical treatment and the use of restrictive practices are part of that, that regime, then where has the testing been? You know, I can show you people that, have, that restraint has been tested on uh, and, and they'll tell you what, it, what it's meant to them it, it going, going forward. So that's an interesting discussion that I think we, we can take forward. And certainly on the national, on, on the national stage, um, as the Director of Equality and Inclusion for NHS England and NHS Improvement, one of the things that I'm really interested in is how we balance the point about uh, staff safety, staff concerns against the needs of, of patients. You know, we're the biggest employer in Europe. We have to look at uh, patient safety uh, and staff safety uh, together. Uh, we don't restrain our staff if they do something wrong or, you know, we put them through a disciplinary process. We talk to them, we can counsel them, we coach them. Uh, and these antiquated systems of controlling people, I don't, I don't think, that, I think they're for a, a, a bygone age and we need to move into the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike. Anthony, can I bring you back again? Are you, you still, you there with us? Yes, I am. I am very much here. I'm trying to get, um, I can't get the video at the moment though, but. Uh, uh, what, what, okay. Could you, could you share with us just you, you, you're, you know, you, you are our absolute expert by experience from the things that you've heard people say, is there anything that kind of struck you, anything that, uh, you you want to ask them about or think we should all be doing anything works I, for you um well what worked for me a few things worked for me um in that well i learned to vet my frustrations through uh, um me, to um, exercise, so I got I, I learned the value of exercise and using it as a way of um, releasing energy. Yeah, so that was yeah. one thing which I learned. That was one thing. So releasing energy, releasing frustration, taking it out on a pillow, things like that. So um, uh, that was one thing I learned. Um, I, I also learned the value of music. I learned that relaxation and relaxation techniques, mindfulness, things like that, really help a lot and um, make a difference in terms of calming someone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I also learned, I also learned, I also learned um, that um, a lot of the time, Emotional intelligence is something which not many people seem to be aware of. And um, my, my understanding of emotional intelligence is, you know, it's the ability to gauge the significance, the social and emotional significance of your actions. So one thing which I learned was, and I read this book by Daniel Goleman, um, in Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman. 
and it taught me that um, there's a significance to my actions, be they responsible or irresponsible, there's a significance to my actions. There's a consequence. And um, so if I hit someone, there's a, there's a consequence to that action. And um, or if I, if, I, if I take out my frustrations on someone, there's a consequence to that. And I didn't want to be responsible for injuring somebody. So I took a step, I, I looked at myself, I looked at myself and I said, do I really want to go down that road? So I stopped myself as it were. I, I had a good look, I had a three dimensional look at myself uh, or a third party person look at myself. And I said, I don't wanna go down that road. And I decided, and I made a conscious decision at, you know, when I had, when in moments of rational thinking, I had made a conscious decision not to um, hit anyone or, at, or, or, or to vent my frustrations on someone. So those sort of things really helped me to um, overcome my personal issues with anger, with frustration, with um, um, issues of dispute resolution that I needed to learn. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Very powerful stuff. Thank you. I, we've got a really, really great question from someone um, who's attending. And thank you so much, um, all 65 people who, who, are, who are listening to these, this challenging conversation. And the question is, generally, people who join a healthcare profession are kind and compassionate. But what happens in training? Because from the side of what the, you guys are saying on the panel, the need to listen and be aware of an individual's specific needs is getting lost. So my question, and probably aimed really at Lewis in particular and Carla, who, who manage large numbers of staff is, is the training not right? That's one of the things that came up on a previous challenging conversation. People feeling that the, the training is not helping them have these kind of tell me, tell me about me conversations that uh, Jackie mentioned people saying that it's they're not taught conflict resolution, but also that they're exhausted. There's too many other demands on their time that get in the way of the real job, which is spending time with a person and enjoying understanding who they are and what works for them. So what do you think, you guys, with the really difficult managerial tasks of large workforces? Shall I, I go yes. first? Go, Lewis, <laughs> yeah. Um, that that's a, a really fantastic question it really highlights mm. one of the kind of key factors in my mind of, of how we we're in the situation that we're in so it, they're exactly absolutely right people go into these professions because they want to help people and quite often they have their own lived experiences or, or whatever that's driving yet we still find ourselves in a position where restraint is very commonly used restrictive practices coercion it is a part of the mental health system um and i when i've when I've had, I think in my mind, part of this, it, it's around the other factors that are around that person, which are in the systems and the structures of how our, our mental health services are set up that gradually shift people in that way. So it might be that um, there are things like bed pressures that are, are pushing people in a certain direction. It might be a lack of support for staff members or feeling that if they do something wrong, that they, they are not going to be supported or they're going to be um, disciplined rather than worked with to reflect on and learn from those situations. Um, it might be staffing pressures. Um, all of these things that are kind of external to what that person is wanting to do that are preventing them or gradually nudging them towards doing things that they, they actually wouldn't really want to do. Um, so I think it, a lot of the time it's almost it's almost a capacity issue for people, it, both in terms of capacity in terms of their actual time because it's being robbed because there's not enough staff and award or whatever it might be. As, and also their emotional resilience. So doing this work every day, going into a PQ is hard work. It's taxing mm -hmm. on your emotional and psychological state. And you, we, we need to invest in the welfare of our staff members so that they can come in and um, do the job to their best ability. So I think there's, there's also some work for, for uh, mental health organizations 
um, to do around thinking about what are these different factors that are gradually nudging people to over to having to work in more restrictive ways because perhaps at the time it feels easier to restrain somebody than it does to do the harder longer slower work of really engaging with them and understanding what um, makes them tick and also talking to somebody for an hour two hours to resolve that situation rather than doing it quickly with a forceful measure. Mm -hmm. Thanks Lewis and I mean yeah. Carla what's your yeah, I would agree with those kind of human factors um, that you've mentioned, Lewis, is that it, it's multi kind of faceted, really. But my, I'm going to say the same thing that I say to when, you know, um, people enter our secondary services. The workforce also brings their lives to work. I know as a profession professional, I've always said, well, you know, when I leave my front door in the mornings, I leave kind of my house and everything there and I go to work. And then when I leave work, I, but we all know having worked in that professions and the kind of professions of care, that's not always the case. You know, we are kind of people and we bring kind of our lives to work as well. And I think there is that important thing of looking at the resilience and well-being of staff, looking also in terms of our workforce strategies and how we kind of address those big areas of vacancies that we experience within the NHS. We know that when we have more stable workforce and we invest in kind of the those table workforce that um, that is much better outcomes uh, for people and also for kind of the workforce themselves. Um, I would agree that often the time factor is often what people will kind of cite they don't always have enough time or it's workloads or there's kind of competing pressures. I think it's about then what kind of leadership is also available within the NHS. And, and, and it's a different kind of leadership of just the kind of managerial type of leadership is that kind of compassionate, authentic warmness that we need to create within the spaces we work. And I think giving people those space and time to reflect about the work that we are doing. So I think it's multifaceted, but realizing that our workforce are people as well. Can I so, add to that, Geraldine? Great. Yes, thank you, Mike. Because um, I, I mean, I think this this is the, the question that goes to the heart of what I was saying uh, mm. before about um, about about staff. Because um, you know, our staff in in South London and Maudsley, they they uh, a lot of our staff uh, live in the community as well. They're part of the community. Uh, we have staff who, on top of their very difficult and stressful jobs uh, working for SLAM. Are worried about their children getting home from school without getting stabbed because of the yeah. condition in yeah. South London. Uh, these are these are real, real issues, uh, and the fact that people join this uh, profession because they care, um, I understand that. But you know, I used to work in in a, an organisation that regulated the police, and police officers served uh, uh, swore an oath of office. They swore to protect and serve, but you often saw the conditions upon which they're working, the con the context yeah. in which they're working, producing individuals who I investigated who were violent, who were racist, who were corrupt, uh, who were dishonest. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of that was driven by the uh, fear and the danger of the day-to-day -day, mm -hmm. uh, day -day job. And uh, as has been said by uh, Lewis and Carla, th there's, a, there's a, a responsibility on uh, employers to look after the well-being of staff. And the particular context that we have at the moment with COVID and what that is doing to the well-being of frontline NHS staff, both in mental health and in the acute sector, uh, people who are working in intensive care units, people who, have, who are uh, 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 with people at the moment of their death when families can't join them. This has an, a huge impact on the uh, ability of staff to do their job the way that perhaps we expect. So I, I, I'm with, uh, with Carla on this point about caring and compassionate leadership, which doesn't, doesn't mean that, you know, you do something wrong, you're gonna be before a hearing, you're gonna lose your job. It's about us understanding the context in which people are working and making sure we give them the tools and the support to do the job the way we expect them to do it. Thank you, Mike. So in a, in a sense, you're also talking about the just culture. Carla mentioned that at Mersey Care, they have a just culture, so they're, they've taken, um, which is a method that was originally used in the airline industry and then in the transport yeah. industry, where people come and they say, we have this problem at work. We've had a big, serious onto incident, or we've had a near miss, or we've had a problem. 
and that we want to share that with everybody so that we can all come together and find different solutions to this. And it's that it's not that, as you rightly said, Mike, it's not uh, unconscious bias of having more people who have been participating in restrictive practices taken away, you know, sent on leave, disciplined and so on. It is about having a culture where the organization says, come and talk to us, talk to us about the problems that you're having, share with us because we genuinely want to find solutions. It's, it's not about um, blaming people. So can I ask one of the things that's coming up a lot in the chat? So we have Ben Gold saying what training is given to people working on the front line, for example, the police, about alternatives to forced restraint in areas of conflict uh, resolution. We have somebody else saying, I'm an occupational physician. Fantastic, you're very welcome. Who looks after staff who are assaulted and bullied. Compassion is important, but so is the business continuity. Now, Jackie, as an ex-accountant, what a fantastic career change. You talked to us about the, the fact that it just economically makes no sense at all not to be doing the right training for staff, frontline staff, whatever sector, basically, that are involved in difficult situations, because ultimately the treasury, more money goes out of the treasury, getting but, often bad care. What, what's your response to these, these questions? And, and about... also start, staff retention. So I agree with everything yeah. that the others have said about supporting staff. And um, so I would, what I wanted to say to that is regular supervision so we kind of the psychology team and us as the art psychotherapy team, we offer supervision either individually or in groups to the team, but also debriefs after mm -hmm. an incident. Yeah. And again, thinking about, you know, how they are. So, you know, how are you after that? And as you say, do they need time off or what support do they need with that? But if you don't look after your staff, you waste a huge amount of money on um, training staff and recruiting staff, which so, so from a financial perspective, it's not cost effective, but also from a human perspective, you know, as you've all said, they do bring their own lives in. So taking time to give people some space to, you know, to acknowledge oh, I was a bit scared then or that person does frighten me. So being able to be honest about what it's like to work on a PICU ward and what support you might need from your colleagues or when you might need to what, what we call tap out and let somebody else take over because you've been triggered so in psychotherapy with trauma we talk about our own you know um and in pbs they talk about fast triggers and slow triggers so fast triggers would be that immediate trigger where you're emotionally in it and all your cognitive skills you know you're not necessarily able to access those if you're fully triggered whereas slow triggers are those really slow build-ups um that could be yeah i've left the cat at home and there's no food and are the kids going to be safe to go to school today? And there's a whole build up. And uh, again, in PBS, we call those setting events. So what are the setting events that lead to a trigger actually triggering a much bigger event? Um, and acknowledging all those for the staff, for the team, and also for the individuals that we're supporting on the wards. And just being open about it and having a really open conversation mm -hmm. about what the, what the challenges are. Um, and then your staff, you know, somebody talked about family, will feel included and properly protected and supported by their team and they're more able. You can't care for another if you don't feel you're being supported yourself. You can't keep giving if there's nothing there for you. Yeah. So it's it's because um, we are all in it together. So fundamentally, I think in one way or another, let me check with our panelists if this is right. I mean, We've made amazing progress in England in the last five to 10 years in raising the profile of mental ill health and people being able to have a conversation about it. What we're talking about here really is life skills for all of us as individuals, our service users and our staff, as well as actually creating positive mental health. So. One of my questions is, and I think some of the questions that are coming through, great questions coming through from people listening is, shouldn't some of these techniques and methods be a core part of what we're teaching kids in school? As a school governor, I was the school governor for health and well-being. I'd have been right up for that. Um, could we do shared learning with other, with other agencies? How do we get through to government and this new era for the 10-year plan in the NHS that we're going through that says, 
creating positive mental health, creating a healthy workforce that work in a way that is actually economically far more sustainable than what we do at the minute, starts with that provision of life skills. How do we do that to people? Should we have free apps on the NHS, Mike? Should we be trying to get into every school? Should Maudsley Learning, which currently does simulation training for positive behavior, how, how, can we, how can we get these messages out there to a wider audience that will ultimately then feed into the mental health world? I think, I think a lot of, sorry, Jackie, go ahead. I was just gonna say, could we link up with what's going on in learning disabilities, the transforming care agenda? Could we link up with what's going on in other areas instead of us all doing our own thing? Why, yeah. because these issues are across all social care. Yes. Yeah, indeed. And I think there's definitely a role to play, um, you know, in schools. And I'm pleased to see that there's more funding kind of nationally going in there. So definitely, I think so. I mean, just to slightly pick up also on a point that Jackie earlier mentioned, and I don't want to lose, is when we talked about restrictive practices or around when you kind of mentioned personalised care, that you know, there are also alternatives to outside of what's happening in hospitals. You chose to have a flexible and a practical solution within your own kind of family environment. It doesn't work for everyone, but for you to have that money and kind of look after your son and kind of and have that support as well. So it's really thinking creatively and working with people in a different way. And I think, yeah, early, if we can go really upstream into kind of the schools and start getting some of those, you know, early messages in there for people. Certainly stop domestic violence, probably. Mike, your comment. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, start further up, upstream. That's, that's, I think, part of the message that uh, I'm seeing um, NHS England that that you know fighting uh, bushfires here there and everywhere isn't doing it. Um, we, we're not talking enough about the people that are coming back for treatment after they've been treated. People that have been out in the community. <clears throat> we're, we're not talking enough about how much we support um, our workers, our staff who are supporting uh, families and individuals in the community at a time where, where when resources are very very tight. Um, we, we haven't talked about the uh, CAMS waiting list and young people uh, being uh, being um, addressed and their needs met uh, uh, earlier on in the, in, in the, uh, in the uh, process. So I'm, I'm all for uh, taking the, uh, the battle, if, if that's what it is, further upstream uh, and allowing our, our staff and our people more time and space to do the sort of things that Jackie and Carla and Lewis are talking about. Um, I think I think we have to demonstrate an understanding for what it's really like, you know, day day by day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This isn't this isn't easy. We're yeah. we're talking about very distressing, very difficult um, uh, work. We're talking about people that work and live in communities where those problems are not confined to the the confines of of the hospital gates uh, or the community centre. Um, these are deep rooted uh, societal problems, uh, often uh, emphasised in the areas that we that we serve. And that's historic, and that's one of the reasons why I talk about uh, about understanding the context. Because you can come come into uh, into a, uh, one of our wards with the best will in the world, the best training in the world, the best attitudes in the world. But if you don't understand the day to day experiences of the people that you're working with uh, and you're, you're treating as as uh, patients or service users, then you're going to miss a trick. Uh, and you know, Geraldine's heard me say it so many times. We, we, you know, we, we, we look at these these situations sometimes. We get the serious instance reports. We listen to the stories of patients and service users, and, and stakeholders who tell us that they want things to be done differently. Uh, and then we seem to come up with all sorts of excuses as to why it's going to take 10, 15 years to achieve it. And that's too far down the line for people for whom right now is a real challenge. And that's both service users, our patients, uh, and our staff. So we've got a, I think, I think a sense of urgency in addressing some of these these ideas and putting them into practice is what we need to be doing. Thank you so much. And we've come to the end of our challenging conversation time. Can I thank so much every single member of the panel? I have to say, I've come away inspired. I've come away far more hopeful that we can practically do something about this and thank you very much to the people who've answered in the chat questions and I promise the people who are worried that we've talked about all of this but is it going to happen I can absolutely assure you it is going to happen so thank you very much indeed 
and join us next month for a challenging conversation which has a real Christmas, wherever you're going to spend it in whatever tier has a real Christmas theme, talking about alcohol. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, Geraldine. Take care.